Welcome to XX Will Travel, a podcast for independent women travelers. I'm Kathy Polkerbeck. And I'm Inez Bellina. And we are super excited because today's topic is travel and film. This is a very research intensive episode because Inez and I are geeks. Yes. And this is what we do. So I put a call out on three travel groups. For favorite travel movie or a movie that has made you travel somewhere, has inspired you. And we got 684 comments and 215 different movies and TV shows. We covered all seven continents. We got a variety of documentaries and animated movies and it was crazy. Mm -hmm. And I compiled them all into a spreadsheet because I love spreadsheets. (laughs) <laughs> Kathy approached us with a sociological eye. I did. <laughs> so I am very excited to hear the data, the results. Yes. So for our animated movies, mm-hmm. we got one, Moana. Okay. I haven't seen it yet, but cool, cool. Who doesn't want to go to Hawaii and hang out with The Rock? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So for documentaries, we got two frontrunners. One was called Map for Saturday, about long-term travelers over four different continents. Oh. And Virunga, which is a documentary about saving Virunga National Park in the Congo. And that is where there are silverback gorillas. I've seen that one. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So go see those. A lot of ladies, I know they say action skews towards men, but ladies love their action movies too. People were really into Taken, which takes place in Paris. (laughs) Apocalypse Now Mm. from Vietnam. All the James Bond movies. All the Star Wars movies, which take place all over. Rocky. We have a lot of people climbing the steps of the art museum and jumping up and down like Rocky. And Indiana Jones inspired so many people to visit Jordan and Petra. Yes. Well, I think Indiana Jones in general just inspires you to want to travel. Right. You know, to like discover ancient ruins and civilizations. <laughs> exactly. Which, and on that thread, the Tomb Raider mm. from, Cal- from California, Cambodia, <laughs> and Thelma and Louise. Oh, yeah. Cross country. Totally. Though, I mean, let's hope the ending is a little bit... (laughs) Right. It's not as grim. (laughs) Right. That is our wish for you. Yes. (laughs) Classics. Casablanca, The Sound of Music. How many people have been on that tour in Salzburg? Mm -hmm. La Dolce Vita, The Quiet Man with John Wayne, took place in Ireland. Three Coins in a Fountain, Roman Holiday, all the Audrey Hepburn movies, basically. Yeah. So um, lots of Italy represented there. As for rom-coms, we have Love Actually. Okay. Bridget Jones. Wait, Love Actually, why? Just because of London? Yeah. London and... Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Christmas. Yeah. Christmas Christmas is a destination. (laughs) And Milwaukee. (laughs) Let's not forget. (laughs) Oh, and I guess there's Portugal, too. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Yes, Mm -hmm. there is quite a lot of travel. French Kiss, P.S. I Love You, Letters to Juliet, Sideways, Chocolat. Okay, I have a theory about Sideways. Yes. I really do like that movie, and I think it's because it needs to be an all-female reboot where my sister plays the guy that's about to get married and I play the uh, the depressed author pa- Paul Giamatti <laughs> Paul Giamatti cuz we've di- I've discussed this extent- extensively with my sister Jimena that that's probably what would happen to us if we were to take a road trip to Napa like we never understood why it was the guys like we just very much identified with either with both characters yeah yeah <laughs> oh. so that's my now in the era of all female reboots that's my hope let's do it <laughs> yeah all right <laughs> So we asked our friends from another podcast called The Cutaways, which is about romantic comedies, and it is run by two ladies in L.A. in the film industry to give us their top three picks for travel rom-coms. And I did tell them, I was like, no under the Tuscan sun. So here you go. Hi, listeners. This is Justine from The Cutaways podcast, where we discuss romantic comedies. And this is my top three favorite travel-themed rom-coms. Number three. 1993's Sleepless in Seattle, directed by Nora Ephron. Really a rom-com about distance, the characters live on opposite sides of the country and have very little screen time together, so travel is essential to the plot of this movie working. Sam's son Jonah arranges the pivotal Top of the Empire State Building Valentine's Meetup for our two heroes after many near misses and it's love at first sight. Well, second sight. I love that this movie plays homage to Tearjerker 1957's An Affair to Remember. Number two, 
1949's On the Town, directed by Stanley Donan and Gene Kelly. One Day in New York is kind of my go-to weekend vacation dream, and I definitely have my hot spots I like to hit up. But in this movie, three sailors are all about finding romance on their 24-hour pass. What makes this movie special is not only New York, New York, but before this movie, films weren't shot on actual locations. And number one, 1953's Roman Holiday, directed by William Wyler. This was the first American film to be made entirely in Italy. A princess on a goodwill tour of Europe escapes one night and ends up in the care of an American newspaper man. She enjoys the anonymity and the ability to sightsee all the gorgeous sights in Rome, all while falling in love, of course. Rome is so gorgeous in the film, it up tourism, and people are still making their way there to reenact moments from this movie. Those are my top three favorite romantic comedies about travel. Please check them out, and please check out me and my co-host Ashley on the Cutaways podcast, discussing the history of rom-coms and filmmaking in chronological order. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcatcher. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as at Cutaways Podcast, and our website is thecutaways.com. The people who get shoutouts for best and funniest selections are one one woman mentioned Space Jam. Yeah. <laughs> for space travel. <laughs> That's very uh, creative. I love it. Yeah. Uh, my friend Bobby Grunberg mentioned uh, Back to the Future 3 because it is a time traveling movie after all. Who says travel only has to be in this dimension? Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Cheetah Girls Barcelona came up. I don't even know what that is. The Cheetah Girls were a Disney franchise, like a group, a singing group. A Raven Simone was a Cheetah Girl. Okay. And they went to Barcelona, apparently. And I, I say, if that inspired you, then run with it. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Children of the Corn, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Weekend at Bernie's. Classic. Home Alone 2, because someone wanted to go to New York for Christmas. And planes, trains, and automobiles for all those business Aww. travelers. Well, it's like the quintessential Thanksgiving movie. And right. it's the only one that really, that's like famous enough and really takes that holiday into account. For sure. Yeah. Well, there were only two Chicago mentions on the whole thing. And one was The House from Shameless. And then the other was Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Which oh. is the quintessential Chicago movie, and I would recommend it. Like, follow that trail for a day. Yeah. You'll see everything. Yeah, and it does hit several of the classics of the city. My Best Friend's Wedding, I think, does a better job of making the city look beautiful, mm. but it's not really the focus. Right. Yeah. So besides Shameless, Game of Thrones, which is everywhere. Yeah. Iceland, Dubrovnik, all, all over Spain, Alhambra, Girona. Like, that's, that film's everywhere. Ballet Kiss Angel which is an Irish soap opera that my mother used to watch on PBS. <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> That's like a deep cut. <laughs> right? That one's for Eugene. Home and Away, which is Australia, an Australian soap. Downton Abbey. Hmm. Doctor Who and Torchwood, which film in Wales. Outlander in oh, Scotland. Yes. And The Walking Dead in Georgia. Hmm. And the honorable mentions are movies from this list that I want to see. There's a movie called Queen, and it's came up several times. It's a Hindi movie about a woman who's dumped by her fiancé, and she goes to Paris on her would-be honeymoon by herself. And one called Pane e Tulipani, which is bread and tulips. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like that? I love that. Yeah. Pane, Pane tulip- and Tulipani. Yeah. That's like, I sound like Mario. Sorry. <laughs> That's where I learned my Italian is video games. And it translates to bread and tulips. And it's an Italian film about a housewife who gets stranded on vacation. Like, for some reason, her family leaves without her. And she doesn't. She tries to hitchhike back home. And she ends up taking a detour to Venice and just starts a new life there. As one does. As one does. <laughs> and so I will wrap this up by giving the top 10 out of yes. all these 215 movies. These were the top 10. Number 10 was a tie between Mamma Mia, which is Greece, okay. and Roman Holiday. Ah. And Vicky Cristina Barcelona. Uh, yeah. Number 9 was a tie. P.S. I Love You, which takes place in Galway, Ireland. And Wild, which is the oh. Reese Witherspoon remake of the Cheryl Strayed book on the Pacific Coast Trail. Mm-hmm. Number eight, three-way tie, Sound of Music, Amelie, ah. and Lost in Translation. Oh, Lost in Translation. Well, how do you feel about Lost in Translation having lived in Japan? 
I feel like it, it encapsulates all that is good and weird about Tokyo. Yeah. Okay. And and it's a good, it's like there's so many people in that city, but they're so insular because I think Japanese people are so insular that, or they're a low context culture, not insular. Right. So, you know, they keep to themselves a lot. I feel like it's a city where there are literally millions of people bustling around, but you can be so lonely in the middle of that. Yeah. And okay. it did a good job capturing that. Number seven, Harry Potter movies mm. and the beach. Oh, the beach. I loved the beach back in the day. I even had, like, I even bought its soundtrack. Ooh. Back when CDs were a thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got that from a lot of people, and I find it interesting because at the end of the day, the beach is pretty much about Paradise Lost. Like, in a way, it subverts the idea of how you can find yourself in travel because... All, you know, have you seen it? Ever? I have not, but it doesn't end well, does it? No, it doesn't end well. Basically, the thing is like, you can try to escape yourself, but you never will. Yeah. <laughs> but the scenery is great. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely made me want to visit Southeast Asia, even though, you know, it ends up being very violent. <laughs> <laughs> nice so, summation. <laughs> Number six, Lord of the Rings. Mm. And Before Sunrise, the uh, trilogy. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about it more when we talk about our own personal choices because before Sunrise trilogy is very instrumental. Yes, <laughs> it resonates with so many people. Like yeah. it came up so many times, and I think it's also people of a certain age. We'll talk about it. Number five, Midnight in Paris. Okay, another Woody Allen. Film. Another Woody <laughs> Allen film. Damn him. Yeah. Number four, Into the Wild. Okay. Which I thought was kind of funny because it's another, not funny, like ironic, because it's another tragic movie. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I know, like, the story behind it. But, yeah. and it does show off Alaska. Like, it's mm-hmm. a really beautiful postcard to Alaska with a dark, dark end. Yeah. <laughs> It tied with The Way. I don't know that one. It's Martin Sheen, Emilio Estevez, and they're walking the Camino de Santiago huh. in Spain. Fun fact, Emilio Estevez was my first star crush Aww. at the tender age of seven. <laughs> I was a Kirk Cameron girl myself. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Number three, which is something that surprised us both. Mm. The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Yeah. Critically panned. Pretty much. It was a remake of a movie that originally starred Danny Kaye, so back in the golden age of Hollywood, Mm -hmm. and remade with Ben Stiller. Yeah. Shot largely on Iceland and Greenland, so I can see the appeal in terms of visuals. Right. Yeah, but it's, it's odd because I've honestly never heard of anyone even going to see it until now. (laughs) <laughs> right so, yeah and yeah. it's it based on a short story it is and i did read an article about kind of the what is it this this character you know the the revival that this character keeps having walter mitty because the short story i think doesn't have anything to do with travel no but it seems like it's only the recent one that is very travel focused exactly yeah yeah because we're more extreme yeah <laughs> We need more stimulus. Our, our daydreams <laughs> can't just be about escaping our doldrums. It has to be like escaping our doldrums while snowboarding off a glacier in Greenland. I've never seen the movie. Yeah. I don't know if that happens. <laughs> Number two was Game of Thrones. Not yeah. a movie, no. but like that seems to be a big reason people are traveling. To Iceland, Croatia, Sevilla, Granada, Alhambra, Ireland. They, Damn. Where oh. isn't Game of Thrones? Yeah. Number one was a tie. Under the Tuscan Sun. Yes. And Eat, Pray, Love. (laughs) Okay, wait. So we can talk about why Eat, Pray, Love is problematic, although I feel like that's been covered in the last decade. But I got a certain resistance from you about Under the Tuscan Sun, which I feel is a lot less cringeworthy, I guess. I still... Okay, you're right. You're right. Eat, Pray, Love, I agree with you, is far more cringeworthy. And it's even... I really like Elizabeth Gilbert, uh-huh. I think, as a person. <laughs> Not that I know her. I've met her. I met her, and we both bonded because she told a story about how she grew up on a Christmas tree farm in rural Connecticut, and that's the reason she became a writer is because all she had was a typewriter to occupy her. And I walked up, and I was like, I was a little girl in rural South uh-huh. Carolina with too much energy and no friends, and so my mom taught me to type. And we, were, <laughs> we high-fived. Yeah. So I was like, all right. 
we're best friends now. Right. Um, <laughs> and then when I found out that, that she got this big book advance before she was doing Eat, Pray, Love, mm-hmm. I was like, that makes it a little less authentic. Yeah. It's not like she just decided to take off. She got real sad. She wrote up a book proposal. She got an advance. And then she was like, oh, I have 60 grand to play with. Right. Under the Tuscan Sun? I don't know. I just feel like it's in the same genre. And it's like <laughs> saying this as a white lady who would totally, white, very white, very privileged, who would totally do the same thing. <laughs> if someone was like, here's your house in Tuscany to fix up, I'd be like, okay. It rubs me the wrong way. And it always has. Even before, like, Donald Trump's election started forcing us <laughs> to re-examine our privileges as, as a people. That sounds weird. Re-examine our privileges. I didn't like it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I mean, I saw it a million years ago, probably a year after it came out, because I remember seeing it on HBO with my sister. And I found it harmless, but this is also me, what, seeing it maybe when I was 20? Right. (laughs) You know, and of course, now when I looked up kind of just a summary plot again to remind myself, of course, the idea of like purchasing a villa in Tuscany to get over your divorce is one, super appealing, but two, also makes you want to roll your eyes. Like, I totally get that. I think what still saves it for me though is just that diane lane is a freaking national treasure that's what i was gonna say yes yes she like (laughs) even the blandest of characters or even as you said like the most like white woman privileged of characters she will still just like put her everything in the performance that i was rooting for her (laughs) you know (laughs) well and i read the book and it might have been i don't remember when this came out yeah, I don't either, but it was like a long time ago. I yeah. might I might have been in my, I was a women's studies minor. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, your biggest problem is that this, this crop of your hobby olive oil right. isn't going to turn out the way you wanted it to. So yeah. that, that might have colored my, my yes. vision. And I did, I read the book first and I had similar issues with the book. Yeah. So. Do they also have the gay tour in the book? I don't remember. Okay. Because I always thought that sounded like so much fun. (laughs) What is the gay tour? Well, that's how she starts in uh, Tuscany. Basically, she's super sad about her divorce and her best friend is like finds out she's pregnant and her best friend is a lesbian and she had booked this tour with her and her partner like to go around Italy. But she's like, well, I can't go now because I'm pregnant. You should take my spot instead. So she goes on this tour called like Gay and Away, and it's basically her and a bus full of gay men, and they're just like popping around different tours of Italy. And um, and I kind of wanted the film to stay there and see what happened <laughs> with the rest of the men in the tour, but that was clearly not the intention of the film. Right. Well, yeah. it was, that film can still be made. It can. Yeah. Please, step one out there. If you are a gay man that desperately wants to write fan fiction... <laughs> Do it. This is it. <laughs> yeah. And now, and now I feel like a million women or like the 40 that mentioned this and all the group are like, me, Kathy's such a downer, <laughs> which, you know, I kind of am sometimes. I mean, I'm pretty sure I've been crapping on Eat, Pray, Love since I even heard what it was about. But at one point, and I think it was on a plane, I finally caved and saw the movie. I don't know. The Italy part is actually quite nice. Like, I can see the appeal, you know, you're in this, like, gorgeous locations, and you're seeing this woman kind of do her own thing. I think where it falters for me is, one, knowing the backstory. Yes. So that just makes me not necessarily buy it completely. And two, just the fact that it ends with her, like, finding love again. Like, right. it's the... She just should have been, like, remained a single badass, you know? When she was so against it. Yeah. And I think that's the appeal for some people. Like, especially the... Well, love comes when you least expect it. Right. That whole thing where it's like, oh, she's healed now. Right. Because she found, like, Javier Bardem. <laughs> Which, to be honest, I would be healed too. Right. <laughs> I'm like, I get it. <laughs> but on the other hand, it just, it ends up, like, completely defeating you know, the purpose of the film, which was for this woman to find herself. Or the book, I should say. But, right. you know. Elizabeth Gilbert, man, she's she's interesting. She is an She's in- a very good writer. Like, before Pray Love came around, I think she had been already nominated for the National Book Award. So there's a part of me that kind of mourns the fact that she's, that her writing has been sacrificed by Eat, Pray, Love. But on the other hand, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about her. <laughs> and, and I love her podcast, her big magic yes. podcast. It's, 
And it's not her fault that, right. that this book was co-opted or this yeah. movie was co-opted. Um, and I, I doubt she had any say in the casting. Yeah. So anyway, and uh, the, the interesting thing, you talked about Italy, the majority of ladies who responded to this question, it was all about Bali. Oh. They all wanted to go to Bali, which I think is like a very trendy place at the moment. Yeah. Anyway, so that was the top 10. Those are my responses that I received. So thank you for everyone for commenting. We appreciate your insight. Yeah. And if you are a member of those groups, guess what? <laughs> we have a group now. We do. We do. It's the XX Will Travel podcast community. So if you want to like interact and meet fellow lady travelers and express your opinions on questions such as these... Please join the group. It's on Facebook. Not much is going on now because we have three members. But this will be changing soon. We basically wanted to announce it at a good time. And this is the time to do it. Right. <laughs> so please join the group. Yeah, you'll see more action in the coming weeks. Right. Today we're fortunate to have Gretchen Kelly with us. And Gretchen Kelly is an expert on set jetting she's also a travel journalist and set jetting is her area of expertise she's going to tell us more about what that is and how you can do it gretchen is an internationally regarded authority on set jetting she currently writes a column on the topic for forbes.com and features on jet setting by gretchen have appeared in afar media the new york post portholes magazine and many others she and her partner Run the website extremeluxurygetaways.com. She lives in New York City when she's not set jetting around the world. So, Gretchen, tell us, what is set jetting? A little over 10 years ago, the British Tourist Authority started using that term to define places that you would go from being inspired from movies or television. And the reason why they did it a lot was because of all of the countries out there that promote themselves, Britain really relies on film and television to bring tourists to their country. Um, just think about all the Masterpiece Theater shows that you've ever seen on PBS and Downton Abbey and James Bond and all the Jane Austen movies and the Bronte movies. It really, really is like almost a cottage industry of itself bringing people to Britain to see the places that those films were made. So the organization that was the tourist authority back then created that term and used it themselves. And I was the first journalist to coin that term in the U.S. It's really a huge phenomenon that's burgeoned since that time. Earlier than that, of course, people would see Casablanca and they'd think, oh, one day, maybe I'll go to Casablanca. Or they'd see all the Audrey Hepburn movies. They'd see Paris and Sabrina and be like, oh, Paris is always a good idea. I should go to Paris. But in the 50s and 60s and 70s, the, the travel industry hadn't grown to the point where it is now. And it wasn't as easy for people to travel. And it wasn't as cheap. So now, because travel is, is accessible this phenomenon has grown. Also, it's changed over the past 10 years. When it started, it was about films, films that inspired people. In the 2000s, the first big instance of this really was Lord of the Rings and New Zealand. New Zealand's economy has been boosted so, so, so much from tourism designed around Lord of the Rings. I mean, you could probably say it was a major part of their actual economy. The whole series was shot there. The country's very smart and savvy about how they promote the locations. They do make many of them accessible to the public. So that movie series, and because it lasted so long, you know, over those multiple films, made an indelible mark in the tourism industry for inspiring travelers to go to a place because a film made their imagination click. The fact that it was real, like yeah. that we'd only, I guess, I don't know, I'd only imagine stuff like that on a movie set or like CGI, but the fact that you could go and frolic in the mountains, you know, <laughs> where the hobbits did, right. was, I think, something magical. If you want to think also in, in terms of uh, how film has changed, Many more movies are now 
made CGI, but back in the 2000s, there was a lot of location filming. There still is. But before then, maybe not so much. Maybe things were done on, on studio back lots. Because it, they actually went, the Weta workshop where the films were put together is actually in New Zealand. And the location filming was done in New Zealand. Those are real places. Those amazing waterfalls and rivers and landscapes that you see, they, they may have been CGI'd a little bit or to, to some degree when they put the monsters in and the creatures and whatever and the castles. But the actual landscapes, those are real. So you're right. Uh, what are some other popular places for set jetting? Well, here in New York, Sex in the City is huge for a certain viewer who loves that show. And there are several companies that do movie uh, bus tours of the locations that are in Sex in the City. The Bond films send people all over the world to go to places where James Bond was last seen. Each time a Bond movie comes out, there's a new location. One of them, uh, not the last one, I believe it was the one before last, they used Turkey a lot, and some of the locations in Istanbul were pulled out by the Turkish Tourism Board and used to draw tourists to them by saying, oh, you know, come to the place where James Bond just left, you know. So Bond films are always a draw, even the older Bond films. And they go to Jamaica, where a resort called GoldenEye is. GoldenEye is actually the house and estate where Ian Fleming wrote the original James Bond series. So you can really live like James Bond by going to Jamaica and going to GoldenEye. Basically, pick your favorite film, and if there's a location in it, you can create a trip around it. I went to the restaurant in Barbados where the, one of the Daniel Craig James Bond movies was filmed. And I wish I could remember the name because it was a wonderful restaurant. But I, I was there with my ex who was big into James Bond, and that's literally how he pitched it to me. It's where the Daniel Craig Bond <laughs> movie was filmed. I know. I mean, there's a, a, I've actually, I mean, not to, not to like lay, I mean, a lot of women love the James Bond films, but they tend to skew kind of guy focused. So at one point I was thinking of um, helping my friends at British Tourism come up with a, a trip which would combine Jane Austen and James Bond and calling it James and Jane. So what? love it. Yeah. <laughs> so you could go with your, your, you know, your significant other. You could go to Britain, and he could go do James Bond stuff, and you could go do Jane Austen stuff, and then you could meet them together back at the end of the day, all happy, you know. Wow, yeah. I know so many people that would do that. I'm like, maybe we would have stayed together if this had existed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe, right? James and Jane. Oh, uh, so what are some good places? Do you know of any uh, good organized tours? for set jetting, for people who maybe aren't ready to venture on their own. Just recently, Turner Classic Movies has paired with Adventures by Disney to create some Adventures by Disney tour products based around films. So if you go to the Turner Classic Movies website, you'll see one trip that they have that looks fantastic, and I personally want to go on it. And it's um, like Movie Rome. Adventures by Disney is planning the trip. TNT is offering experts who will be on the trip to talk about the films. I believe they'll be showing some films like Roman Holiday with Audrey Hepburn and Gregory Peck and maybe some Gladiator films. And they'll be touring some of the film sites as well as uh, Cine Cite, the film site in Rome where so many iconic films have been made. They're going to be able to go there. So if you're really interested in this topic, I would recommend taking a look at Turner Classic Movies website and then looking at the trips that they have listed through Adventures by Disney. Personally, I went on a trip that they did that was a frozen trip to Norway. So I got a chance to pretend like I was Elsa, the snow princess, and be in Norway with all of the things around me, the scenery, the places where the animators got inspired to create Frozen. And the company, the tour company, put this together and they did it with the help of the Imagineers and the animators who actually made the film. So that's one company I would definitely recommend. Cool. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. So and what's been your favorite 
uh, set jetting experience? My personal favorite set jetting experience was like this, the experience that started this for me when I became a travel journalist, which was a long time ago. It was prior to uh, the war in Syria, and I went on a Lawrence's Arabia trip. Oh. <laughs> so I traveled to Syria and Jordan in the steps of the real Lawrence of Arabia and also the cinematic Lawrence of Arabia. The real Lawrence of Arabia traveled through places that were then located in Syria and Jordan, and we went to all of these amazing places, some of which are no longer here because they've been destroyed by the war. But then when we got to Jordan, we we took up the area that was in the film, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, Lawrence of Arabia. It's a great travel film. It's just beautiful to look at. And I went on camelback for like several days through Wadi Rum, the desert that you see Lawrence going through, with tents and Bedouin guides. And we went through Jordan on this trip. It was just so amazing. So I'm on a camel and I had a Walkman and I had the Maurice Jarre soundtrack to Lawrence of Arabia with me. And I'm listening to it while I'm on a camel in Lawrence's desert. And it was like having a movie open up all around me, not in virtual reality, but in reality. And I felt as close to being a female Lawrence of Arabia as one could possibly be. Yeah, you are totally transported. The only thing that was a negative was it was hot, hot, hot. It was the desert. It was broiling hot. And you don't feel that when you're in a cold movie theater. Right? Right. Exactly. Well, thank you, Gretchen, for, for sharing your story with us. And Gretchen is a columnist at Forbes. And her website is ExtremeLuxuryGetaways.com. And where else can people find you, Gretchen? They can just do a Google search and read a lot of the stories that I've written over the years in places like the New York Post and on the TravelChannel.com. And um, there's a current story that I wrote for El Decor, which you can read. Um, so I've got a lot of content on the web. You just got to search my name, Gretchen Kelly, or look at ExtremeLuxuryGetaways.com where there's a lot of links and other stuff, or just look at my Forbes channel, because I've got a Coco travel story there, and by tomorrow, I will have an alienist travel story there. Awesome. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Someday for everybody. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. So thank you, Gretchen. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So, Kathy, I would love to hear what your top three movies are. So I have more than three going as far back as I could remember. And I have The Goonies. Ooh, good one, good because one. Because it's travel, but not really travel, but does show the Oregon coast, but they do. It's it's a it's a quest movie. Mm-hmm. And it is very, you know, they're on a search for adventure and pirate loot. And I really like Martha Plimpton's character <laughs> because she was a badass voice of reason <laughs> and, you know, she was pretty cool. I'm like, you know, Andy, who was like, meh, bread. Uh, yeah. I, well, first of all, there's the presence of a treasure map. So that already indicates a journey. It's true. <laughs> but two, I always felt bad for, oh, what's the name of the chubby kid? Chunk. Chunk. Yeah. I always felt bad for him because he didn't get to go on that journey. I mean, I know he became really good friends with the with the... With the brother. Can't remember his name either. Well, Inez. <laughs> Remind me. <laughs> I don't remember his name either. But um, he went on an emotional journey. Yes. It was, was a different It was one. an inward journey. <laughs> it was. But yeah, I love the Goonies. This is going to sound dark, but I didn't really appreciate Schindler's List until I went to Poland and okay. like went to his factory and went to Auschwitz. So that is... I I feel terrible. It's a tragic movie, but going to see where it happened really made it resonate more. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's around Krakow. You can see all that stuff. Krakow, Poland. Run, Lola, run. My quintessential late 90s new millennium. I'm going (laughs) to dye my hair. Awesome colors and run through the streets of Berlin movie. And I, oh, excellent soundtrack. Again, with the soundtracks. 
and I still haven't been to Berlin, and it's totally different now, so... Yeah. Why bother? <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? The English Patient. They are in a plane for a lot of the movie, and they show these beautiful, sweeping sh- aerial shots over Tunisia, and I want to go so bad. Um, again, a movie that ends in tragedy. Yeah, a lot of travel movies kind of do. Right. I have to say, now that I'm thinking about it. An American in Paris, which uh... is a movie with Gene Kelly and Leslie Caron, where he's an artist <laughs> After World War II in Paris, and the dancing is amazing, and you have to, have to, have to, have to go on YouTube and Google um, American in Paris Ballet, and it's this beautiful, like, modern piece of ballet, and Leslie Curran was an excellent dancer and artist, and Gene Kelly, I would love him Mm -hmm. so, so much. Yes, I love a dead man. (laughs) And as I mentioned before, the Before Sunrise trilogy is also a favorite of mine because I never had that European backpacking experience because in the summers I was working one or sometimes two jobs to pay for school. So to see that played out and to, to feel the possibility. And even what I liked about that was it showed how it continued over the course of their lives so that is also very encouraging like even if you don't have that stereotypical backpacker experience when you're 18 or 20 you can still travel (laughs) just you know make it a priority you you'll catch up don't worry (laughs) i have a lot of thoughts on the before sunrise trilogy but i'll leave that till the end since it's the one movie we kind of share and we can go into that but i'm gonna go with the first movie That really inspired a little Inez Bellina to keep traveling, which was The Chipmunk Adventure. Ooh. (laughs) Released in the 1986 Cannes Film Festival, which I found astonishing because it is nowhere near as prestigious as that makes it out to be. Astonishing and appropriate. Yeah. It starred such nobodies as Janice Carmen and Ross Bagdasarian as the voices of several of the chipmunks and the chipettes. So this is what happens in the movie. It's an animated movie, and basically the chipmunks and the chipettes are tricked into going on a hot air balloon race around the world that is really the cover for a diamond smuggling ring. Yes. That is the very intricate plot of the chipmunk adventure. But it's awesome because, one, when you're a kid, you're seeing like kids traveling around the world without adult supervision, which was already like... Mind blowing. In right? balloons. In balloons, which is like, what more fun could that be? Some of the highlights of the movies include Theodore never getting a chalupa in Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, all he wants to do is eat in Mexico City, but because they're trying to kind of, you know, fulfill the goals of this very convoluted balloon race, he keeps just like being dragged away right before he eats. Oh, classic Theodore. Classic Theodore. Two. A beautiful duet of the chipmunks and the chipettes just staring in awe at the world as their hot air balloon (laughs) takes them to several destinations like Machu Picchu or Tokyo. uh, Don't don't they also go to Egypt? Isn't there a sphinx? Yes, there is is a big scene in Egypt at the very end. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) But three, I think the part that really got my little heart aflutter was uh, the Chipettes having their feminist awakening in the Acropolis. Oh. Where they tell the Chipmunks that they are the girls of rock and roll. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I love this movie so much. Like, all I really wanted to do was be part of some smuggling operation so that I could travel. So that was one. It's not too late. It's not. It's not. <laughs> like... You know, so, uh, yeah, criminal organizations, any, contact me. Any smugglers out there need a mule? All you have to do is I'm supply here. the hot air balloon. <laughs> Pretty much. You got one. Uh, then the Motorcycle Diaries in 2004 was yes. also a big one, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, is based on the autobiography of Ernesto Che Guevara and the trip he took around South America before he became a bloodthirsty revolutionary. Sorry, I'm not really into the mythologization of... The Che, but before all that happened, um, he did do this like really amazing trip starting out in Buenos Aires that took him and his friend across Argentina, up through Chile, into Peru, um, where they ended up like in the jungle working for a few weeks or months, I don't know, in a leper colony. Yes, because Che was a doctor. Yeah, he was a doctor. <laughs> 
I had yet to take one of those like multi-month trips, but I always wanted to. And seeing that just made me want to do it even more. Like the idea of not only getting to see all this, but also going through a spiritual and political journey as much as I don't agree with where it ended. You know, it just kind of really resonates with the idea of travel being more as something like a pleasure-seeking experience, but also one that opens your eyes. Transformative. Yes. And that soundtrack is amazing. It is. That, oh, Jorge Drexler. I, know. I love Jorge Drexler. Yeah, he's a, yeah, it's like the super chill guitar <laughs> strumming soundtrack. Jorge Drexler is also a doctor. I did not know he that. He gave it, he's Uruguayan, and he gave it up to be a musician, and now he lives in Spain. Look at that. So, transformative. Transformative, <laughs> again, yes. And I think, like, South America is really shot beautifully in that film. And it was, like, a huge international cooperation among, like, three different countries, several different countries. The screenwriter was Puerto Rican, Gael Garcia Bernal is Mexican, director Brazilian, like, all that kind of stuff. And when I was in Argentina, I stayed at this this apartment. It was managed by two sisters, and they, because part of it was, the production was in Argentina, mm-hmm. and they were in charge of weathering the leather jackets worn by Che Guevara <laughs> in the film. And I was like, what do you mean, weathering them? And they were like, we have 40 leather jackets. We had to... Scrape them with rocks and get them wet and scuff them up. Right. Yeah. So These I, are like 20-year-old medical students. They're not going to have fancy new leather jackets. Exactly, which I thought was like the coolest job ever. Yeah. Like, pay me. Pay me to wreck Gael Garcia Bernal's jacket. I'll do it. I'll do it for free. <laughs> so, and then we come to the Before Sunrise trilogy. Because yes. I loved all three films. So, directed by Richard... Linklater. Linklater? I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Who I love anyway. Yeah. I'll watch any of his movies. Well, I love him because he's a director that's really aware of the presence of time. Yes. Like, all his movies are just that. On the passing of time, the compression of time. And, uh, yeah, I just love that thing about him. Dazed and Confused, Boyhood. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then this trilogy. Before Sunrise came out in 1995, where a precocious teeny mess saw it. And my sexuality was immediately defined by it. Thank you, Ethan Hawke. <laughs> yeah, because one, Ethan Hawke, total stone fox. Yes. <laughs> but two, I think it also just made me like super romanticize the idea of doomed love. Like doomed love during travel. I think yes. that's pretty much what I pursued for the rest of my teen and 20s. <laughs> well, I, I noted like that when they get it on in the park... Julie Delpy is wearing the epitome of a 90s outfit. Like, yes. she's wearing a white t-shirt and then a long dress with spaghetti straps over it. And I think some kind of boot. And that's like... That's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's what I wore every day. And I look... This is going to make me sound super old. But I look now and I'm like, everybody dresses so skimpy. Like, she got it on with Ethan Hawk. Fully covered. Yeah, by wearing like this super like long, simple maxi dress. And so there's a lot of things that I loved about this trilogy. And one thing I noticed, which you kind of mentioned, was that every single one of those movies does explore not only how you change, you know, when you grow up, but also how travel changes when you grow up. Like the first movie is this very backpacking, youthful, freewheeling type of travel, right? Our whole lives are ahead of us. Yeah. And like we have all this freedom to just roam around for a day. The second movie, which takes place in Paris before sunset, he's actually on a book tour. So it's like work travel. And Julie Delphi's character just happens to be living in Paris. And this is how they meet up. So... And she's, she's what? A human rights act advocate? Yeah. yeah. Who's uh, dating like some photojournalist like a freelance photojournalist but it makes it very different because he's like under this time constraint where his agent is basically telling him like you have one hour then we need to get to another uh, location you know which again is kind of this idea of like traveling for work and traveling with more constraints and like you have different obligations and all that kind of your, stuff your time isn't your own yeah yeah, yeah. You're being, your time is being bought exactly and then before midnight which is the end of the trilogy They're vacationing in Greece with family and friends, which again is like a totally different type of travel. And at that point, their whole romance, like it's still strong. They're still married. They have children. But a big part of the tension in that movie is seeing what's already passed, kind of 
looking at it for its reality and not this romantic view of love and marriage that we have yes. a lot of times. And and to go with the time theme, realizing how your time is limited. Yeah. Because I think a bit, they don't spend a lot of time together. Like, their sex life is not the best. They Their kids always need them, which, you know, they're the kids. But their time shrunk. Like, yeah. from the beginning, the first one, when it was so expansive, this is like... You have no time. The real time where they're alone is when they go off in a hotel by themselves because their friends have told them, you guys deserve a night on your own. And that's when they actually really get to talk again. Well, the previous films were just the both of them talking. Anyways, I could go on about this trilogy. I love it so much. They were all filmed in location, which makes it even better. So if you haven't seen it, go watch all three. Yes, all of them. (laughs) Bring your tissues. So we also asked the question, are there any movies that dissuaded you from travel or made you think twice what were yours at least for my friends because i'm usually like whatever i'll still travel one broke down palace Mm. with 90s it girl claire danes right (laughs) and also hostel which i'm not into like torture porn so i've never seen it but i did look up the plot and basically it's just like just gore Well, there's not much we can do about not staying in hostels, but as for Broke Down Palace, don't accept packages from strangers. Especially if they're charming, dashing Australian strangers that are trying to, that's like trying to hit on you. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. You know, listen to the airport messages that you hear all the time. Do not accept packages from strangers. Yeah. Do not leave your bags unattended. (laughs) Well, I looked up the plot summary of Hostel, and I have to say I kind of laughed out loud because basically... These, like, backpacking dudes from the States are convinced to go to a hostel full of, like, super hot babes in Slovakia, which ends up being this, like, torture, like, situation, right? But I'm just like, of course dudes would just go to a hostel for the promise of hot babes. Well, I'm like, they deserve what's coming then. But it's (laughs) the same in Broke Down Palace. It's hot uh, hot Australian. It is. So basically, avoid hot travelers. (laughs) Aim low. If you're going to hook up, make sure you go for the dirty, gross kind. Right? <laughs> or like seven or below right. on a yeah. 10-point scale. <laughs> Unless he's Ethan Hawk. Right. In yes. which case you know he is pure sunshine. Pure. Or, or at least his character was. My response to that question was when everybody was freaking out about travel to Mexico. And um, this is, I'm going to butcher this because I don't have a Spanish accent. Amores Peros came out. Oh, yeah. And it was basically all the bad stuff that could happen in Mexico. That's true. I do love that movie. It's, it's a gorgeous <laughs> movie. I love it. <laughs> Except for the dog part. Yeah, no, that part's, ugh. But yeah. anyway, yeah, but I got over it. And you should too. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever been so scared off by a movie that I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I won't go on there, you know? Right. <laughs> but uh, although I will say that Broke Down Palace definitely made me a little paranoid. About accepting packages. About accepting packages. And hot strangers. And hot strangers. <laughs> if it's too good to be true, I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> it probably is. So was there any place that you went to because of a specific movie that like kind of was not what the movie made it out to be. (laughs) No. I did not have an answer for that question. I guess because I don't travel for film a lot. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about it because I kind of am the same way. Like, I don't necessarily travel for film. Like, there's films that inspired me to travel, but I think it's more about the idea of travel than it is about the specific location. On the other hand, though, I almost want to say that Movies set in New York have completely warped everyone's idea of what New York is. Ooh, wait, I have more of that for (laughs) for the next question. Yeah, yeah. Is there a fictional movie world you really wish you could visit? (laughs) Mine is New York City where you can be a struggling artist or an average Joe and can have a huge apartment and support yourself and go out every night. Yes, that's (laughs) exactly my point. That is a wonderful tie-in. Because, okay, so when I lived in New York, I actually ended up naming this, this... Like delusion, if you will, which I called like the sex in the city syndrome or the, and... or the friend syndrome or the friend syndrome. And it has almost like little to do with the actual shows, but it's more of the idea that people's first exposure of New York, unless they're like they live there, is usually through film and movies and TV. 
right? And so whatever TV and movie they happen to love that's based on New York, that's what they think New York will be like. Yep. And then they move to New York and they travel to New York and they either like are really disappointed that it's not like that or they will do everything in their power to force it to be like that even though the reality of New York is telling them that's unfeasible. Right. <laughs> So that's what I would call it the sex in the city syndrome, because at least when I lived there, sex in the city hadn't been as maligned as it is now. Like, I think people were still holding on to that idea. But everywhere around me, you saw people living with like 15 different roommates, not being able to make it as an artist, not having fabulous clothes or anything like that. But on the other hand, like, they would hold on to this. It's like, no, I'm totally living the Carrie lifestyle, even though they're like drinking PBR in someone's rooftop. You know what I mean? Even though Carrie herself was horribly in debt. Right, yeah. (laughs) I think it's really a struggle. Like, I don't know if I can think of a good movie or show that actually depicts what it felt like to live in New York. Right. Yeah. Even girls. Like, that wasn't even realistic. And that was like, they prided themselves on the realism and stuff like that i was like nope (laughs) no i'm sorry at this point in life like if you set a show in new york and all your friends are white that's not realistic and i'm not trying to be pc about it i i think i said this before but it's like when i lived in new york i was surrounded by lots of like upper middle class liberal educated people and my group of friends was super diverse. Like, this is it, you know, because I've heard that excuse. It's like, well, what do you expect? She's like a liberal, you know, college educated crowd. Obviously, they're all white. I'm like, dude, no. I was at Columbia. I'm Latina. Like, it was not an all white environment. And, you know? and it's funny because my friend who lived there in the early 90s said that the space is so dense, like you can't help but live next to people who are different from you. Yeah. Like, and I noticed I went to New York for work, which is the best way to experience New York with an expense mm-hmm. account. And the thing that floored me was the fact that I saw so many, like a mix of like white people and people of color that we do not have in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Like I'd stopped in the middle of Times Square and was like, <laughs> like kind of like this is how the world could be right you know and chicago it really like made me realize how segregated chicago is i bet if i go walk around my neighborhood i might see like a black person yeah but it's not going to be as like racially balanced as new york city right which makes like all the excuses people make for like all white shows set in new york even worse right best best new york tv series most realistic new york tv series sesame street probably yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) even the walking muppet you will probably encounter that in new york you know so yeah i love that answer i mean we got kind of the usual suspects harry potter narnia avatar Lord of the Rings, so Middle Earth. Yeah. I think probably of all of those, Harry Potter is the one I would most like to visit, but I'm so over Harry Potter and just like its refusal to die that I don't even know if I would be that excited about it. Well, since time travel is a legitimate form of travel (laughs) for our purposes, I picked 1960s Italy. I want to be in mod Italy. I want to be fashionable. I want to ride a scooter. I want to drink cappuccino which is actually a great tie into the other question we had on our list which is who is your film character travel icon and my response was literally going to be every actress in an italian film wearing a red trench coat yes that's all i want to be when i travel or or audrey hepburn yeah mine was oh Audrey Hepburn, but only uh, Italian Audrey Hepburn. Right, yeah. Italian Audrey Hepburn, mm-hmm. for sure. Yep. Back to scary places. I just wanted to throw this out here. Yes. Any movie that made you scared of a particular location? Any movie that takes place in the Middle East gives oh. you a warped <laughs> interpretation of what it's actually like to be in the Middle East. Yeah. As, as you may know, I traveled to Jordan, I think two years ago, where it, which Jordan is like a film mecca. The Hurt Locker, Indiana Jones, Zero Dark Thirty, The Martian, Star Wars Rogue One, Mission to Mars. All of those were filmed in Jordan because the Wadi Rum Desert looks like Mars. It's got red sand and beautiful rock formations, and it's just flat as far as the eye can see with no development. It's amazing. It's one of my favorite experiences ever. And the people in Jordan are super awesome and super nice and hospitable because hospitality is built into the culture there. 
And it just makes me sad to hear people say they don't want to go. Yeah. And when I went, the, the every driver I encountered, every tour guide, it was like, we're so glad you came because of all this stuff that's going down with Syria. Nobody comes here every, anymore. And, like, nothing has happened here. So that would be my answer to the place with the most warped view or the place that is, like, seen as dangerous when it's not. Well, Africa has kind of... has pretty much the same issues although i will say we are recording this on the opening weekend of black panther yes. so no one answered wakanda on our fantasy world yet but i get the feeling that most people will say wakanda yeah yeah we, tomorrow <laughs> right because we we asked the question a couple like a week or two ago yeah before it came out but yes wakanda wakanda is a fictional universe we uh, like to travel in i mean just seeing michael b jordan who i believe maybe plays a villain but Whatever. Dude is smoking hot Whatever. in that movie. And I've never been a Michael B. Jordan fangirl. I'm like, oh, he's talented. But not necessarily, you know, my speed. But I've been seeing him in those promos. And I'm like, mm, mm, mm. Oh, man. I, I want it. <laughs> I have loved him since The Wire. <laughs> I loved him in Friday Night Lights. I loved him in Fruitvale Station. Like, I've been, oh, yeah. He's been on my list. And then he made some dumb movie with um, Zac Efron about yes. dudes being dudes. And even, okay. even that. <laughs> Could not, <laughs> could not knock him down a notch in my eyes. Yeah, anyway. we'll, we'll we'll forgive him for that one. Everyone has their missteps. Ev- everybody you know? needs money. Yeah, like, it's true. Come on, he has bills to pay. Although, man, after Black Panther, I'm sure that that won't be a problem ever again. Exactly. <laughs> Oscars are coming up. Yes, they are. So we figured we'd we'd do a little uh, a little rundown of the Oscar nominees for Best Picture this year. And kind of talk about how how wonderlust worthy they are. Yeah. But first, uh-huh. let's take a look at some Oscar winners from the past. Let's do it. So, some past Oscar winners of real of travel movies: Accidental Tourist, mm. which I have never seen; Vicky Cristina Barcelona; the movie Up. Oh my God! <laughs> how did I not put Up as a seminal travel movie in my life? Because I don't think people think of animation when they think of travel movies. But I thought of the. Freaking chipmunk adventure. <laughs> well, in animation travel movies, I think that is the star of the canon. Right, so. right. You know what I love about the role of travel in Up? I think it really brings home this idea that you really can't wait to do this. Yes. Like, that's kind of what spurs, you know, the old man's travel to begin with. It's like a lifetime of regret. Right. That's why everyone cries in the first 10 minutes. So don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't live a lifetime of regret. Yeah. Next is An American in Paris, which mm. is one of my favorites. Motorcycle Diaries. The Descendants, which is super gorgeous. Super gorgeous. That's the one in Hawaii? George Clooney, written by Jim Rash, who, like, everybody was like, wait, that's the Dean from Community. What is he doing writing films that make you cry? (laughs) Nobody said this, and I'm so surprised. Moulin Rouge. For some reason, Moulin Rouge was just one of those movies that never got to me. I just did not get it. I had a Moulin Rouge experience (laughs) in London last march so they do this thing called secret cinema where they have a secret location and every year they pick a different movie and you interact in the movie like you wear costumes one year was 28 days one year it was back to the future and when i went it was moulin rouge and you get assigned a character so you have to be in character the whole time and people just burst out into song the guy next to you all of a sudden starts singing the soundtrack and then at some point, they start playing the movie, and it's like Rocky Horror Picture Show where they act it out. <laughs> yeah. Super fun. Follow them on Instagram to see what they're doing this summer. What character were you? They save the real movie characters for professional actors. Mm-hmm. So I was Leone Lioness or something like that, and I was an inventor, and I was supposed to carry around blueprints. Oh, cool. And they give you suggestions on what to wear, and you have an armband so you can see who else is like also an inventor so you can talk to them so it was awesome yeah that sounds really cool it was super fun finally braveheart oh scotland i mean it looks beautiful it looks gorgeous so let's go through the rundown of this year's best picture nominee so i just wrote down the ones that are only nominated for best pictures although there are obviously other nominated films that can be wanderlust worthy but let's start with call me by your name I have not seen this, but you are very enthusiastic about it. Well, okay, so 
I think of the list. This is probably the most uh, wanderlust worthy this year. It takes place in an Italian villa in the northern region of Italy in the 1980s, the mm. early 1980s. The first hour of the movie is a total slog. I'm not going to lie. I had to keep eating popcorn to not fall asleep. But the only reason I stayed with it was because of the landscape and the costumes and just the fact that it was like spark, you know, just hitting all, all my right notes. Like all I wanted to do was be in that villa and read. But then the movie does take a turn. I mean, kind of when the romance between um, Elio and why can I never and Oliver uh, begins, then it really starts to speed up and it ends up being completely beautiful and heartbreaking. But yes, I mean, if we want to talk fashion icons, like movie fashion icons, I want to dress like all the women in that movie dress, including Mafalda, the very uh, old yet loving housekeeper of the Italian villa. <laughs> that says a lot. It does. Uh, you'll never see peaches the same way again, but... Other than that, it's beautiful. <laughs> oh, I have to see it. It is. It is. Like, there's a... It, it was one of the few movies this year that really did make me tear up at the end. And I'm not an old softy. I will, like... I barely cry. Ever. So, <laughs> that was that. Um, so, next, we have three World War II movies. Yeah. Dunkirk, The Darkest Hour, which is about Winston Churchill, and Phantom Thread. I'm kind of over World War II movies. <laughs> so, there's so many. There's so many. Like, just Winston Churchill alone. There's so many movies. I know. And have you seen any of them? Uh, any of the three? Yeah. No. Okay, so I saw Dunkirk, and, like, I can objectively see how it's a quote-unquote good movie. But on the other hand, I'm at a point where I'm saturated by the white male narrative. That's the only way I can explain it. And World War II, I think, because it was probably... One of the last times where this particular demographic was heroic, you know, and actually fought on the side of good. I understand why it's lionized and why people keep going back to it. But at this point, like, I'm just tired. You know, like, I just want to see other types of films. Or I want to see other perspectives. Like, why can't we get a movie about the lady nurses of World War II? Yeah. About the waves and the wax and women spies and why is it always like you said like the male the male yeah. point of view like come on there's so much out there women photographers yeah totally we contributed too guys i know <laughs> <laughs> like i would much rather see that i know spike lee had a movie about like one of the black only battalions in world war ii but apparently it wasn't very good but i would even prefer that than seeing more of just like oh look at the brits being heroic again which is not to say they weren't yeah. uh, however <laughs> we've seen it so many times yeah and let's say and i say this with the utmost respect for the people who actually did this it's more just like the way hollywood approaches it where they keep thinking this is the only film we want to see well and it's kind of like those are the people who go to movies too yeah you know the youngsters <laughs> they're not hitting up the cinema like they used to except for movie pass if that you know yeah. Movie Pass has kind of revived the younger demographics interest in going to the, the theater. That's true. But on the other hand, and just to, uh, you know, the kind of the biggest box office hits this year have all been movies that have been like, like black focused, like focused on black narratives. And actually, I think like the highest or the biggest demographic of moviegoers now is like young Latinos. Huh. Like Latinos will still go and see movies. And so I'm just like, where are the movies for us? Right. Like... You know, we're starving. Exactly. <laughs> so um, so those are the, yes, the World, War, the World War II contingency that's up every year. Get Out. Get Out, in a way, is a travel movie. It's about a weekend getaway to uh, the home of this guy's girlfriend's parents. Um, he is black. She is white. I'm sure you guys obviously know this. Is there a scarier trip than the one where you go to meet someone else's parents. No. No. Okay. <laughs> and I think I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's about being out of your element completely in many ways. And having the odds stacked against you for something that is completely beyond your control. Yeah. A little thing I learned this weekend is that in Spanish, they translated the movie title to Uye, which for some reason I really enjoy. <laughs> what does it mean? Um, it means flee. 
Oh. Like the literal translation would be flee, but it's like a good, you know, translation for get out, I guess. But I was wondering how they were going to translate that. And it's ooh yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, we have Lady Bird. Yeah. Which is a gorgeous film. Um, probably not gorgeous from a cinematography perspective <laughs> because it takes place in Sacramento, California, and Lady Bird is trying to get as far away as she can from Sacramento. But ironically, it has spawned many articles and think pieces and guides <laughs> to Sacramento, California. Yeah. I think my favorite was, what was it? Either an onion headline or a reductus headline, which is just like fans clamoring to learn more about the fantasy world of Sacramento after seeing Lady Bird. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I love that movie. And Sacramento takes is obviously like a huge character in it. Although I almost want to say it's a stand-in for everyone's hometown and you're just trying to like get away from it. An honorable mention, and I think this is nominated for Best Supporting Actor in the Florida Project. Mm -hmm. That is a, I keep calling them gorgeous films. It is not a gorgeous film. (laughs) It is about a woman who lives with her daughter in a week-to-week hotel or motel and right outside of Disney World. So it is the seedy underbelly of Orlando, Florida, and and poverty that's right under your nose. Like, people spend thousands of dollars to take their family to Disney World, and there are people, like, barely scraping by less than a mile away. It was interesting to me because, for so many reasons, the little girl in it is amazing, the mom is amazing, there's a DCFS element and it, it breaks your heart because you're like, this mom loves her kid and is just trying to provide any way she knows how. I'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. And I think, I don't know personally, but I, I have a feeling there's a lot of people just scraping by yeah. in Orlando on the fringes of this Disney empire. And that's kind of what um, Florida Project addresses. Mm-hmm. And Willem Dafoe plays this manager of this motel complex where tons of people just live week to week. And he's the protective force Mm -hmm. of it. And it it breaks your heart. Yeah. Well, kind of on the note of seedy underbellies, I mean, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri will very much reinforce the the travel warning idea of the NAACP, (laughs) among other things. I will say it does make the landscape of of Missouri of Missouri look really beautiful, but in terms of kind of the society in it, man, that is like a jarring movie. That's it, I loved it. Princess McDormand is like my spirit guide at this point. <laughs> Her rage feeds me, but uh, but yeah, it does not make the state look good at all. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. And then the Post. I guess it's the Washington Post. I have no idea. Oh, it's Catherine Graham. So there we go. And yeah. Then... So apparently we really didn't care about that one. No, we're like, nah. But then The Shape of Water is basically Guillermo del Toro's fantasy world of what Baltimore would be like in the 1950s. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. And it has a South American element. It does, because the sea creature is from South America, deprived from his home. And there's a journey at the end. There is, Yeah. I, I mean, I love Guillermo del Toro's, like, color palette in oh, the movie. Blues and greens. Yeah. And, oh, gold. Mm. Yeah. So it's a beautiful film, but I don't know if you necessarily would consider it wanderlust worthy. Right. Yeah. Maybe if you just want to leave your life behind and start someplace new. You're right. <laughs> Maybe in that sense. One last note. I was in L.A. for the Oscars in 2016 uh-huh. at the, a party at the Roosevelt Hotel. Yeah, we have actually a whole episode about it. We do. Yeah. And you should listen to that. Long story short, the Roosevelt Hotel is headquarters for E! And all the people who are reporting for E! And the closest we got to a celebrity was Ryan Seacrest's <laughs> driver. He was <laughs> hanging outside the hotel waiting for Mr. Seacrest. And he didn't, his name was Marty. He called him Ryan. It sounded like they had a good relationship and that he was a very considerate boss. And that's all I have to report because it was right after the Paris attacks and the San Bernardino attacks. So security was very tight and they saw, the, these security guards saw us walking towards them in our fancy dresses and said, turn around, ladies. There's nothing for you here. Damn. Right. They didn't even, like, let you give the good old college try. No. No, they didn't. Wow. Uh, But it was fun. So, anywho, which ones were your favorites? Listeners, let us know. Yeah. (laughs) 
And if you like this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, on Podbean, on Stitcher, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Uh, we have a website, xxwilltravel.com, where you can find more info about us, including signing up for a monthly newsletter, which just gives you more travel tips and info. We are also on Facebook and on Twitter and Instagram, at xxwilltravel, and join our Facebook group. It will be more active soon, we promise, so you can reach like-minded folks and maybe tell us what your favorite travel movie is. Thank you to Gretchen Kelly of Forbes and ExtremeLuxuryGetaways.com. And thanks to The Cutaways. You can also find them on iTunes if you like rom-coms. They are your ladies. And until then, go forth and travel.